Hello, friends. Ni hao. Thank you for having me. So my name is Matt Stempek, and I've got a little bit of a state of civic tech presentation. Thank you for coming. Um, so earlier this year, at another civic tech conference, there was a talk by the US military. And that talk was specifically about using agile technology innovations to improve operations on military bases and with US bomber planes in the Middle East. Now, the military is a huge portion of the US government budget. So if all you care about, yeah. <laughs> there's no slides. Yeah, sorry. You have Twitter, you have screens. I don't have any slides. Um, so anyway, if you're explicitly focused on government efficiency, the military is a great place to start because there's a lot of waste there. But there was some pushback from the audience and online and on GovZero News from people who didn't get into the work of civic tech to streamline how the United States military deploys in the Middle East. And the conference organizers gave a thoughtful response and about why they invited them to the conference and their vision for civic tech as a big tent where to scale we need to reach everyone. And I think it created a healthy debate. And it's interesting to me because that exposed a fault line in civic tech. As we all work to define this new field, between those who would argue that our goal should be efficient, modern government technology, and those who say we're working for something a bit more subjective, that we're a movement. In whichever way you feel, as a field, it's not just okay to say that we don't improve, we don't consider improving weapons to be civic tech. It's imperative that if we do feel that way that we say it. Because a community is defined not just by who it includes, but also by who it excludes. So I'm only here to say one thing today, which is civic tech is defined by our values, or else it's just government IT. I'll say that again. So either civic tech is the work we do to animate and bring to life certain values in the world, or it's the government IT industry. And not to pick on government IT, we have a lot of overlap with it. But that's where values agnostic, profit driven tech for government goes. Over time, we will get fast government websites, they'll be responsive and mobile. But will we feel if we've accomplished our missions if the content on those websites is promoting fascist policies or war? But the design is really nice. Does it still count as civic tech? Any revolution risks being appropriated. And in appropriation, it ceases to be a revolution. It might even cease being a reform. And while we're proud of how cheap we are in civic tech, we're cheap. A few startup acquisitions gets the incumbent government IT vendors the hip technologies that we're building and the warm relationships that we have. So our values in civic tech can't just be about the tech. We can't just say agile development, open source code, good, waterfall methodology, proprietary code, bad. And we can't celebrate pure technological efficiency either, like our peers in the smart cities world. We need to stand for the change in the world that our tech will bring, not the tech itself. We need to focus on the outcomes of the work and not just the methods of how we work. And we have to know that tech will help bring that change that we're talking about. Now let's admit it, that's a challenge to those of us who get excited about tech. Some of us do favor the more efficient option over the, you know, the messy democratic consensus. Some of us create participatory planning documents and say that to add to the document, you have to pull a, a GitHub request, knowing that most people can't do that. So you can say that my arguments are normative and subjective, and you wouldn't be wrong. So the question is, can a professional field like civic tech be so normative? And I'd argue that fields are driven by normative values all the time. Um, as an analytical person, I really enjoyed my economics class in college and university. Except the way I was taught it was an incredibly libertarian field. They were against any kind of regulation. They said if you follow your own greed, that will be the best thing for the world because the market will respond. Uh, and then was, they basically uh, ignored externalities, which I think is funny given how many externalities we're living through right now, like climate change. So in their book, A Theory of Fields, the authors Neil Fligstein and Doug McAdam lay out how new fields emerge, like civic tech. And they emerge not in a vacuum, but from an intermesh network of existing fields. So civic tech emerged from fields like, say, urban planning, government technology, uh, political advocacy. And people go back and forth between these fields. They're not silos. Code goes back and forth. Money and funding go back and forth between these overlapping fields. So the authors of this book say that new fields are plastic and malleable. They're shifting collections as the actors in the field come to define the fields based on what concerns they find salient. That defines the field. So yes, civic tech and many fields can and do exhibit normative values. And as key actors in that field, we have a role to play in what defines that field. So what are those values? What is it we stand for? We need to establish them. 
I mentioned that one way we can establish values is by looking at who we exclude, whether it's you know, smart city sensors, if they don't involve the community, is that just surveillance? Or maybe status quo government technology where they waste billions on inefficient technology that hurts citizens' lives with bad products and gives the whole government public sector a bad name? Or the new era of bad governments that are looking to repeat the human rights violations of the past but with better databases this time? The question for those of us at this conference this week is, should we contribute our work, our talent, our energies to, to efforts that make governments like that more legitimate? And it's complicated. You know, Ethan mentioned this morning, some of us are institutionalists, some are insurrectionists. Maybe we go back and forth. We can work together towards the same world from the outside and the inside, as the earlier presentation mentioned. And I honor and respect the civic tech community that's currently inside the U.S. government right now doing things like protecting the U.S. Census, which will determine where the next 10 years of power go in the U.S. It's not a fun place to be right now, but they're inside keeping the government running. Am I personally going to go work as an innovation fellow with the Trump administration? No, I don't want my energy legitimating that administration. It's not why we're here. But we are here for a reason today. We believe that we're better together than apart, that there's honor in serving the public even when there isn't a paycheck, that we form governments to protect the weak and strengthen the collective, help all people realize their potential. And in civic tech specifically, we believe that we should apply the new possibilities technology allows us to address the challenges we face together, that innovation should be used mainly to improve lives. If you prefer, some, if you prefer something more formal than what I'm saying, academics call what I'm talking about pro-social values. That's things that bring us together, that improve the bonds between people, and antisocial behaviors are things like war, harassment, harm to others, sabotage of collective systems, poisoning of open cultures. That's what we're up against right now, as you've probably seen firsthand in your country. And the strength of our response hinges upon whether we stand up to it. I think there is harm done in neutrality, and we can't legitimize antisocial regimes with our talents. Those of us who work online, who work in the open, whose projects depend on trust between strangers, we face more aggressively potent threat vectors than we did even five years ago. And I think it's our responsibility as the people who evangelize using technology for democratic purposes, as the people who have the gift of learning new technology quickly, who enjoy nerding out on it, and who have benefited professionally and personally from technology becoming more central to how the world is run, I think it's our responsibility whether or not we answer it. So all of you here are in my community, you're why I'm here on the other side of the planet today, why there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Because community, as a word, has, defined, has, has transcended way beyond the geography that we originally came up with it. So we have to take care of each other, whether that's mental health support or cybersecurity and encryption. Even letting each other step out of the fight for a minute or two to step away from screens and come back rejuvenated. But proactively, we have to coordinate better, because our opponents are. And I witnessed something unsettling in 2016. I was working in the Hillary Clinton campaign office in Brooklyn, and I'm standing, not at a standing desk, but not because it's healthy, but because there's no room for chairs. There's so many people at the desk that you can't sit down. And so I'm hearing from our supporters, especially women, that every time they express support for Hillary online, they're getting targeted with vicious language. Mostly, we know now a lot of it was from bots, but at the time we didn't know that. So they stopped expressing themselves online or they only did so in closed venues. And we now know it was a coordinated campaign to silence them. And we saw white nationalists outside the US, people working in overnight time zones, in foreign IP addresses, coordinating their attacks on democracy together. They were using the social media tactics I've trained pro-democracy groups to use. They were coordinating the strategic timing together. They were creating visual memes. And they were taking advantage of detailed nuances of how content moves on social media platforms except they were doing it to harass young people, to attempt to suppress votes. We were able to fight back on some of it, some of the voter suppression. We weren't able to succeed in fighting back on the harassment. And what we saw at the time was, of course, only the tip of the iceberg of what we'd later learn. But we now know antisocial forces were coordinating online using the same tactics and methods and forums that we use in civic tech. So my question today is, are we so capable of being so effective across borders and time zones to defend our democracies? I think we have to be. And today, in too many places, we're being forced to ask a delicate question. What happens to tech for good if the people running our governments aren't necessarily working to, for the good, to improve lives? In simpler times, we might debate 
the best way to improve lives, and we might have different answers. But maybe we can at least agree that technology to create databases of minority populations isn't what we consider a public good, that physically attacking journalists who share accurate information isn't good for our society. Civic tech has to be more than just governments plus computers. Now, some of us would prefer to stay political, and I think in many cases we should be nonpartisan. But civic tech concerns power, and power is always political. Public health advocates in Mexico were targeted with weapons-grade malware because as the nation with the highest combined rate of obesity and diabetes in the world, they wanted a soda tax, which evidence shows works. And so they used malware against them. Public election officials in the U.S. right now are up against uh, cyber attacks that are orders of magnitude beyond their response capacity. And our online public discourse is flooded and corrupted right now by targeted harassment, which is a direct attack on the open web that so many of us grew up with and the values that we've dedicated our lives to. So we're absolutely in a new era. We're way past the earlier days of assuming that tech was a universal panacea. But that doesn't mean we can stop paying attention to tech either. It's sort of an arms race now. I've long believed that being early to new tech if that's a technology that bears out, it gives us the rare opportunity, a window of time within which we can win battles that we otherwise couldn't. Tech multiplies our effect. And that only works if it's a good category of tech. You know, I remember people buying islands in Second Life and virtual real estate, and that didn't end up being a productive area for us. But things like social media or SMS campaigns, if we're able to leverage them before everyone else does, that's an asymmetric advantage for some causes that are otherwise underdogs. So the potential is only available for a window of time. And until then, everyone, after that, everyone else catches up to the technology, at which point the technology becomes table stakes or a necessity. It becomes you know, an additional expense where the incumbent power can, can use it and it's no longer a disruptive force. So our challenge is that right now, while many of our democracies are facing incredibly dark times, it's a golden era for people that care and people that are taking civic action and protests and, and resistance and everyone's asking, how can tech support rather than erode democracy? And that's us. That's, that's our field. So public awareness of the problem area we work in is so much higher. And it's very tempting to say, well, if they want to, find a, if they want to do that, they should find us and not just start their own new thing. And I know that. And in a perfect world, they would. That's one reason I spent my whole summer upgrading the Civic Tech Field Guide with thousands of categorized entries so people can find the existing work. But we need to do better, too, to reach more people as a field. Open source is better, but we can't live on that distinction alone. We need to be more inclusive, not just in our policies, but in who feels comfortable showing up to our meetings each week. And we may need to pay, take more political positions. Depending on the laws in your country, that might require starting a sister organization. We already have to be more vigilant about information security. We know that we're bigger targets than we were even five years ago if we're working for democracy. And there's some new groups helping with this that are here, which I'm excited about. And we need to support each other in these times in this field across national and regional lines on the map, as we are here this week and in Bucharest next week. We need to learn from each other, which is why I love that GovZero News puts out English language updates each week for me to understand the work they're doing. And we need to communicate our work so successfully that the average person is able to understand the broad outlines of what civic tech is, the way they might understand you know, their basic civil rights. We need them to understand what we're doing here if we expect their support and participation. <coughs> we can establish new expectations for citizens to have of their governments. New York City now has an algorithm review panel. So if you're going to use an algorithm for a public sector thing, like assigning which school someone's child goes to, we now have the expectation that an expert review panel is monitoring that algorithm and seeing what goes into it, seeing if it's biased, seeing if there's unintended consequences. Because you know what people really care about in New York? what kid their school goes to, what school their kid goes to. So the more we establish and communicate these rights, these ways of doing things, the more civic tech moves from niche to basic expectation. We may be surprised after pushing all these years how quickly that can occur in the public consciousness. We've spent over a decade now preparing civic tech and values-informed technology to become an overnight success. And some of the principles we've advocated for are gaining mainstream visibility. The idea that the government sector shouldn't have a monopoly on public interest technology. That startup tech companies need to follow public regulations if they want to operate somewhere. That algorithms are gameable and fallible, and we need to be careful using them on the public. 
So there's an easy cynicism on the impact of civic tech. On our dark nights, we wonder if we're, if we're making a difference. And it's true that just opening up data and commenting on legislation hasn't reinvented or saved our democracies. But it's also true that we're changing the way that, of the work that democracy has done. It's no longer strange for a government office to partner with outside groups to accomplish more with tech. Data-driven decisions, user-centered design, these things are much more familiar concepts than they used to be. And when governments fail, civil society groups are increasingly picking up the slack and building things to show them what's possible. But if we want to have lasting impact, this goes to the earlier presentation, we might need to think about assuming traditional power. Which is, until then, we risk being seen as window dressing and symbolic you know, innovation exercises that are just pilots. And it's funny to me, because I don't think any of us got into civic tech to have power. <laughs> That's not, there's so many more direct paths to that than civic tech. But we have to send our own into the formal ranks if we want to achieve, achieve the degree of change that we seek, if we want to actually change the culture in government that will outlast any given project. So just closing on a personal note, I'm not a religious person, I'm a humanist, and that means I believe in the potential of humans. And I use the word believe carefully here because my choice to put my faith in humans, there's not as much evidence for that just like there's not as much evidence for religion. It's just how I want to live my life. It's a, it's a faith. And it's not an assertion that I'm correct. It's just an assertion that I think this is what we need to do. So you, GovZero, Summit, you're the humans I believe in. This community, you guys inspire me in these times when so many others have failed my faith because you're so talented and clever and you're using your incredibly uh, valuable skills towards the most important possible causes. You're fighting a lot of different fights at a time. You're creatively advancing when you shouldn't be and sometimes stubbornly remaining, which can also be success. And in my mind, there's no greater calling than that. So please take a stand, Civic Tech, and thank you. Let's go through the, okay.